president for event planning. So it's been great working with this org this year. Uh, before we get into introducing the panelists, I just would like to take a little bit of time to introduce some of the other um, members from SILC that are here and members of the alumni relations and annual giving staff. So we have Ann Gilbert and um, Jennifer LaFon here today. They're from SALC members. If you guys just want to wave, um, give a wave to everyone. Um, there, Ann Gilbert is a second year student. Um, she is on the event planning committee for SALC and Jennifer LaFon is our president for SALC. So um, thank you so much guys for being here today. It's really nice to see you. And I would also like to just take a second to introduce some of our um, alumni relations and annual giving staff. So we have um, Angelina, who has spoken already. Um, hi, Angelina. We have Peggy Pattison, who is director of alumni relations. We have um, Judy Renat, who is director of the annual giving program. Um, Jackie Elliott, who is the assistant director of annual giving. We have Michelle Geyer Borthwick, who is also the assistant director for annual giving. And um, so thank you all for being here today and um, we look forward to this conversation. So now I would like to introduce the panelists that we have here today, three wonderful people. Um, first, we have Christian Williams, a 2013 and 2015 graduate from the College of Business Administration. Thank you for being here, Christian. Um, thank you, thanks for having me. Of course, um, Hank Durkin is a 73 graduate of the College of Liberal Arts and Education. Um, hi, Hank, thanks so much for coming on this call today. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. And lastly, we have um, Michael Carter, who is a 72 graduate of the College of Liberal Arts and Education and a 78 graduate from the College of Business Administration. So hello, Michael. Thank you so much for being here today. And we're looking forward to hearing from all three of you. Thank you, Megan. Um, so now I would like to hand it off to our first panelist, Christian Williams, who's going to tell us a little bit about himself and what brought him to Detroit Mercy. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christian Williams, and a little bit of background about me: um, went to Detroit Mercy, uh, started in the fall of 2010. Um, I completed the five-year BSBA program, um, BSBA MBA program. I'm sorry, and then I went on to start my career at Toyota North America. Um, after that, I decided that I wanted to do something that aligned more with my passions, and I started my own uh, business consulting agency where I help people with uh, professional development, HR services, resume writing, cover letter creations, salary negotiations, personal statements, and things of that nature. So that is what I have been doing um, full time for the last two years. April will make two years. Um, so that's pretty much where I, but I, what keeps me busy these days. So. <laughs> And I essentially, I, you know, I really love Detroit Mercy. Um, I really like the one-on-one -on -one and individual experience that I got with my, you know, professors and with my fellow classmates. And so, it, you know, it felt like home. Um, I got two degrees from Detroit Mercy, so I really just wanted to give back. So I started a scholarship um, this well, la end of last year in honor of my grandparents who passed away in 2010 and 2019. So I want to be able to give back. Um, I received several scholarships while I was at Detroit Mercy, so it just seems only right that I do the same, so. Thank you so much. Um, we can't wait to hear more from you. Um, next, Thank I would you. like to pass it off to Hank. Hank, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, what brought you to Detroit Mercy, what your scholarship means to you, and kind of what you're doing today? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, Hank Durkin, class of 73. Um, I'm a native Detroiter at Rosedale Park, if any, anybody's from around there. Um, but my father died when I was very young and my family moved to Salem, Oregon, which is a long way from, long way from Detroit. Um, I decided in, when I, in high school that I wanted to work for a newspaper. And while I applied for colleges in Oregon, being an aspiring journalist, I really wanted to, to go to school in a city with competitive newspapers. Um, being a Detroiter, U of D was the perfect choice for me, but going to a private college a couple thousand miles away from home was a tall order. Um, and without a scholarship and financial aid from the university, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, the scholarship meant that I didn't have to have a job while I was a student. And that meant that along with classes, I could spend my time working on the school newspaper, the Varsity News. Um, it, was, it was a twice a week publication back then, so it was a lot of work. Um, I was on the staff all four years, and I was the editor my senior year. Um, and when I um, graduated, I had not just a degree from a great school, but I also had plenty of practical experience. Mm -hmm. uh, as it turned out, I didn't stay in a newsroom for my career because, because of the well-rounded education, a curious mind, 
um, and what I had learned at, the, at, at U of D, um, I made the transition to managing computer system that the reporters and editors used. Eventually I progressed into PCs, networking, system management, and that led me to a 20 year career working for Microsoft, um, where I, I retired from there a couple of years ago. Uh, quite a, quite a, a right turn there to go from liberal arts journalism into, into computer science. Um, I, I wasn't as technical as my peers at Microsoft, but be, I, because I had communication skills, I was able to carve out my own niche, stand out from my coworkers, and build a reputation that made me very successful in a very tough environment. Um, and I credit all of that to the broad education, the opportunity to learn outside the classroom, and the, the critical thinking skills that I developed at U of D. About 20 years ago, I reconnected to the school, um, living in North Carolina for the last 40 some odd years. Um, I, I, it's kind of hard to drive by the campus and do much, um, but I reconnected. I wanted to give back because um, the school had done so much for me. I know that without what I learned at the university above and beyond journalism, I wouldn't have been as successful as I was in my career. And I got more and more involved. Um, I'm on the um, alumni, National Alumni Organization board, um, and I'm doing some work with the uh, journalism, the communication studies department at the university. Um, and giving back to me is really important because I, I look at it as I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have that from the university to begin with. Thank you so much, Hank. Um, it's a great point, and we really appreciate um, hearing a little bit of your story, and we look forward to hearing more. Um, next, we are going to hear a little bit from Mr. Michael Carter. Um, Michael, if you could just tell us a little bit about what brought you to Detroit Mercy, um, kind of what your scholarship meant to you, and where you are today. Thanks, Megan. Good job, Christian and, and Hank. Uh, let me share with the group that uh, I'm, a, again, a graduate uh, of the class of 72, and then went back and got an MBA in 78. What's unique about my journey is that uh, for those that who were not aware, but I was part of, part of the what they call the Project 100 class. So a little bit of history regarding the Project 100. When Detroit had its rebellion, its riot in 67, you had a group of city leaders that came together. And, and one of the city leaders was at that time, Father Malcolm Karen, who's the president of, of UD. And they had a conversation about so we don't have another one of these type of scenarios where literally, again, we had, again, the infrastructure of the Detroit city that was literally destroyed. And it has not, in my estimation, come back to, to a large degree. If we don't wanna have another repeat of that, what are we gonna to do to look at bringing value? Well, their decision was to start this program where they're going to allow 100 kids, 100 young people in from Detroit public high schools. And let me share with you, this was a diverse group. This was, again, kids from Osborne and Denby, and so it was black and whites. I don't know if there were any Hispanics or other ethnic groups. But what they did was they provided, again, scholarships, they provided mentorship, and they provided, again, tutorial support. And the idea was to look at making a difference. And they really did. They made a difference, and it allowed someone like, like me to look at having a great opportunity, because I had left home at 16. And if it wasn't for, in fact, at the end of the day, uh, uncle who in fact knew about this program and helped me fill out the application to make a go of it to apply. I'm not just sure where my future would have left because as my high school counselor said, who I had never really seen until my junior year, I see you having three choices, four general motors of Chrysler. Now, let me share with you, that wasn't a bad option at that time because we had full employment in Detroit. Detroit had a million seven people. And at the end of the day, you could work at the automobile industry and provide for your family. We had a strong, robust, middle-class family, but I had higher ambitions. I wanted to go to school because I knew that it was gonna be a means to allow me to succeed in life. So Detroit, at that time, the University of Detroit, not University of Detroit Mercy, took a chance on me. And they, in fact, had gave me an opportunity. And I thank God I had a wonderful guardian angel that adopted me. Her name is Dolores Davis. And she adopted me because I was a working kid who, again, as I said, left home at 16. So I would work. I would have to go to work right after, in fact, classes. She called me every night that first semester. She knew what time I got home, at, which was right around 9, 30, 10 o'clock. And she would ask me very specifically about, so 
what did you, what class did you have today? What grades did you in fact, again, receive if you received any grades? Tell me about your homework. So she was a guardian angel that in fact played a role in, in saving my life and making sure that again, I had this great opportunity. Because she said, this is about you getting out of school in four years and getting on, getting on with your life. You will have all the time after school to look at having a good time and playing cards and socializing. But right now, let me share with you, your, your focus is about school. So Detroit has been, a, University of Detroit Mercy has been a part of my life and my family's wife, because that's where I met my dear wife of almost 50 years. To that end, we have a charitable fund that provides scholarships to kids throughout the country. Not only University of Detroit Mercy, but University of Michigan, Fisk University, you know, Meharry <clears throat> Medical College, on and on and on. So we place a high importance on University of Detroit. We play a high importance on education, but more critically, U of DM, it made a difference in my life. We have a scholarship in the name of my former counselor that provides a full ride room and board because we think that at the end of the day, it's really a disservice we do to students who come out of school with $100,000 worth of debt. That is not something that we thought was appropriate. No other country does that to their young people. And we surely wanted to make sure that people have a great start in their lives. So a little long winded, but at the end of the day, I hope that what we share today, both Hank and Chris, Christian, hopefully, hopefully will have impact. A lot of the stuff that we'll say you'll forget about. But if we touch just one of you, you have an obligation to give back because there are so many folks haven't had and will never have the opportunity that you have. But to much that is given, much is required. And we expect and hope that in fact, again, you'll take some of the things we say to heart and you'll look at being a part of this kind of a panel three years from now, four or five years from now, but with the emphasis on again, giving back, paying it forward. So Megan, I'll turn it back over to you. No, in fact, I think I've got to turn it over to Christian. So Christian, it's all yours. Um, sorry. Actually, I think we're going to hand it back to Megan because I believe she has okay. a question. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay. okay thank you. That. That's okay. Thank you so much for sharing, Michael. Um, really appreciate hearing your perspective, your point of view, and everything. And thank you, everyone, for sharing a little bit about yourselves. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, before we get into our Q and A part of this panel, which I encourage everyone who has any questions right now or thinking of anything, please send your questions in the chat um, as you come up with them, because there will be a point in time where we'll. We want to hear from you guys and what kind of questions you have to say. Um, but before we get to the open Q and A, um, the Student Alumni Leadership Council does have a question for each of the um, alumni panelists here today. And that question for each of you is: In what ways are you currently giving back to the university, and what is your motivation for giving? Um, so we'll start the uh, with Christian, if that's okay with you. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to take a little bit of time to answer that question, we really appreciate it. Yeah. So I've um, served as a virtual mentor last year to it was uh, two business students. Um, so that's one way to give back just to give them perspective on, you know, being a student and then life after being a student. Um, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, I just started the scholarship. It's called the Ernest and Geraldine Towton uh, Memorial Scholarship, and it's in honor of my late grandparents. Um, one thing, you know, my grandmother always, you know, instilled in me and told my mom is, how important education was and she always said you know get yourself an education and you can essentially be self-proficient and no one can ever take that away from you and what we realized getting older was she wanted us to be the opposite of her you know because back in that time frame my grandmother was born in 1926 so you know back in that time frame women were very heavily dependent upon men and a lot of them you know did not go out and work they did not have careers and so you know she always wanted everyone she knew to be self-sufficient. So that was kind of one of my, you know, motivating factors for starting that was to honor them. Um, and then, you know, I just wanted to give back because I've been, you know, extremely blessed. Uh, I was able to have a career with a company, but also say, hey, I'm not really interested in this anymore and start my own business and still be able to fi financially sustain myself. And I just wanted to give back to students because I had a lot of help. I mean, I had I earned several scholarships throughout my um, undergraduate studies, and that really helped alleviate, you know, financial burden for myself as well as my parents. So, 
it just made sense that I would start this um, and hopefully continue it, you know, continue it year after year. Thank you so much for sharing, Christian. Um, I'd like to hand it off next to Hank. Um, same question for you, Hank. In what ways are you currently giving back to the university and kind of what is your motivation for giving? Thank you. Um, so as I, as I mentioned before, I went through, and I think like, like uh, Christian and Michael, I went through school on scholarships. And a lot of what I do is based on paying it forward. I want the next generation to be able to, um, to, to, go, to go to college. There's, I do have a scholarship established, um, either fortunately or unfortunately, it's in my will, so this college doesn't have the money yet. But, and I hope they don't get it real soon, but eventually there will be one in my name. Um, I um, also, I, I wor I'm working with uh, Peggy on the, on the National Alumni Association board where we try to get alumni involved and, and build that way. Um, and I've got a, a project going with Dean Denham where we're raising some money to um, build out and reconstruct the media or the communication studies program. Um, a lot of things have changed since it was designed many years ago. Um, a lot of the equipment is outdated there. So we're um, going around to other graduates of communication studies at the university and tapping them on the shoulder and then twisting their arm and then putting them in a headlock and trying to get some money out of them so that we can redo all of that. Um, so that we can have a, a more meaningful and a, a better equipped facility a more meaningful program because we're working on redesigning the whole program. Um, and the people who are helping on that are folks who went through it quite a while ago and have lived through a, a, a communication um, career. Um, the other thing I do, and this is a this is a really small one, but it's the one that I'm that that touches me the most and I find the most meaningful. Um, I put some money in the in one of the funds at the university every year. Um, or every couple of years, and the one of the professors in the communication studies program takes um, a couple, two or three of the students who work on the Varsity News to a national conference in New York City where they learn about student journalism and stuff like that. Um, and the the nice thing is that the professor asks the students to send me a, a you know just a little note on what they what they got out of it. And, and the one that touched me the most is a young lady who is from Detroit. Um, her dad is a plumber. Um, and she told me that that flight to New York City not only was the first time she'd ever been on an airplane, but it was actually the first time she had ever been out of the state of Michigan. And I just think it's, it's one of the amazing things that the university can do that they broaden people's lives like that, that they're, you know, things that people had never, never done before, never seen before. Um, and I hope that pretty soon I get a note from her one day, I won't have anything to do with it, but that she had a great trip to Europe or went out to the West Coast or whatever it is. Um, I, I think that the university providing something beyond the classroom is really important. So in addition to funding the scholarship, sometime in the future, I hope to provide, uh, and I try to provide um, something for students to, to make their life more meaningful beyond the education. Thank you so much, Hank. Um, really appreciate your answer. That was great. Um, and lastly, we'd like to, again, ask the same question um, to Michael as well. Um, in what ways are you currently giving back to the university and what is your motivation for giving? So I mentioned that, uh, again, we have a scholarship in the name of my former uh, counselor at U of D, U of DM now. And I'm a co-founder of, of a charter school in Detroit. So it, it coincides being a co-founder of this charter school. Uh, for those who are not aware, um, this charter school is, uh, uh, is on the northwest side of, of Detroit. And it's called Jalen Rose Leadership Academy. And I, Partner is Jalen Rose, the former uh, pro basketball player. And he, like Hank and like Christian, as a Detroiter, there is part of our DNA is that issue of giving back. It's mm -hmm. an issue of paying it forward. And so when we set up this, this scholarship, you know, we funded with like $250,000. But the idea was, as I said, to look at trying to provide for us to try to provide 
an opportunity where students could be able to graduate without, in fact, again, not have to worry about whether or not their scholarship's going to fall off the second year or scholarship dollars would fall off in the second year or the third year, and which happens to a lot of youngsters. And so we wanted to make sure that those four years were set in terms of the financially being able to make a go of it, as well as to the degree that they needed to have support in terms of money, I hopefully got you your phone. Uh, but they had financial support in terms of, again, and academic support if they needed that in place, because that's what I received. And it made all the difference in my life. So th this, you know, the, the issue of giving back, I wanted to make sure that it was material that, in fact, as I said, it allowed these youngsters to look at finishing school with without having, again, as I said, significant debt over their heads. I also, I serve on the board of trustees for the university. Um, and so I, I'm honored to, in fact, be a board member. The Whatever time I've got left, that legacy and passion is gonna continue to be about education. You know, I, I give to other not-for-profits, to other causes, but education, because of my UD experience, you know, that's number one. It really is number one. You know, I have, I'm really fortunate to, as I said, to be in a position to be able to do as well as my family. And I, my dad was a janitor. There were seven children in my family. So we never had a house. I never had a bedroom to myself. And so I'm really, really, really lucky that as I said, I had this opportunity and it is not about me. It's not about, it's about you folks. It's about these young people. And again, that issue of giving back, there is no greater return that you have whether it's the issue of a okay, karmic law that you want to use, or even just looking at the monies that you put out in terms of investments, then when you see young people, in fact, again, finish school who really didn't have the wherewithal to make it particularly financially, that is just, there's nothing more gratifying. And when I receive cards and letters from, from, from not only my U of D, excuse me, my Jalen Rose leadership youngsters, but we've also given to other students who are in need, who again, the university said, would you mind supporting with taking some of the funds and providing a $10,000 scholarship to someone who in fact, again, if without that $10,000 can't re-enroll. And so to get those cards and those letters of these young people saying, I, I couldn't have done that, Mr. Carter, without your help and support, it is beyond gratifying and beyond, you know, looking at having a dividend payment that's more than $5. So again, you, you young folks that are on the, this call, it's it really is something that I hope you take serious about, again, wanting to give back and being supportive of your university. Megan? Thank you so much. Really appreciate you and your response. Um, so thank you to all the panelists who answered the question. Um, we would really like to open the floor now to all the other students who may have questions as well. Um, I really encourage everyone to share their question in the chat and then we'll be able to better have that um, conversation once the questions, you know, typed out and read. And Annie is going to um, start us off by reading off any questions that are in the chat. So it looks like we have one question in the chat for Christian. And Michael Banks asked, did you start your business while working for Toyota? Whether it is a yes or no, what are some of the things you did to prepare for going out on your own and starting the business? So to answer that, actually, yes, I did start my business while I was at Toyota. I started it in October of 2018, and I did not resign until April of 2019. Um, in terms of what I did to prepare, let me just reiterate, I do, I'm not one to just tell people to go out on a limb and quit their jobs, you know, if it works for you, fine, you know, I, this, it was kind of, it was kind of done on accident, I guess, you know, it just got to a point where I was just very unhappy and my business was doing okay, that I said, okay, I make enough that I should be able to make this work. So with that being said, one of the things I did is kind of looked at my income, <laughs> average income, um, you know, looking at potential, um, saving up money. Before I did that, I paid off my credit card. I, you know, saved, got myself a nice emergency cushion. Um, 
really started trying to scale up the marketing, things like that. So again, I don't just tell people, yeah, go quit your job. No, 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 you know, <laughs> but if it, if it works for you and, you know, go ahead. But, um, and also, so what I did is I kind of started uh, kind of maximizing my employer's benefits. I made sure that I got went to the doctor before I did that. I went to the dentist, you know, got rid of, uh, you know, took care of my health needs and things like that, saved up my emergency cushions. So um, those were kind of some of the things that I really did to prepare. Does that answer your question or do you want me to expand uh, anywhere there? How did the, how did some of the connections you, you make at Toyota, how did that help? with um like building your business well actually i always make a joke and say that toyota still pays me sometimes because <laughs> i have a lot of them that come to me to help with their resumes so uh you know the thing is i worked in a pretty technical industry i was a buyer i worked in supply chain uh purchasing negotiating cost of auto parts yada 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 i worked with a lot of buyers a lot of engineers things of that nature so they come to me because they know hey he used to work here he knows exactly exactly the type of things to ask me and the type of keywords and the type of you know verbiage that a lay person who has not worked in that industry would probably not know to ask so I would say that's one thing about the connection is that a lot of those people come to me now and they're my clients and I've helped them get jobs and they've referred me to other people. Uh, that's great, I answered my question, thank you. You're welcome. Our next question is for all of the panelists. What was the biggest struggle outside of financial need in college? And Christian, if you wanna start. Hmm. I would say the biggest struggle can be, sometimes it can just be time management, you know, because there's just a lot going on. Um, you have, you know, five or six different classes and you're trying to balance that, trying to balance having a social life. And then I think sometimes just the pressure you put on yourself, <laughs> you think because you didn't, oh my God, I got a B instead of an A, you think your life is over or whatever. <laughs> and then you <laughs> you get older and you're, I'm not saying of course, don't perform high. You know, I was always, you know, uh, shooting for the stars, but at the same time, that one B you get is not gonna ruin your life. If you, you know, try your best, try your hardest, but don't think that your life is over, over one grade, and things like that. You get out and you graduate and you realize, okay, that really didn't matter. I mean, my GPA was still good. I worked hard, you know, and then just trying to really navigate where you wanna go. Because to be honest, when I graduated, I wasn't really sure. Um, I had the MBA, I had two, three internships under my belt. But um, I secured a really good job, but knowing what I know now, it probably wasn't necessarily where I wanted to go with my career. So sometimes, you know, you take a job because it fits what you need or fits your pay uh, expectations, but it's not necessarily exactly maybe what's going to fit your needs. So I think that's just something to keep in mind to really try to make sure that you kind of know what you're getting into, even though you kind of still won't. <laughs> but yeah. Um, th this is Hank. Let me let me add on. Christian stole both the things I was going to say, but let me just reinforce that. Um, when when you're in high school, which none of you are, but when you're in high school, you had your parents saying, "Hey, you know, did you do your homework tonight?" You had your teachers. You know, everything was kind of lined up for you, and you know, it's two weeks to get your paper turned in and stuff like that. When you get off to college, you don't have any of that. That structure is not there. And learning how to manage your own time and learning how to um, you know, you know, get stuff done that needs to get done and not let it all wait for the last minute. I mean, all-nighters are great, but boy, they really do wear you down after a while. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, want, I want to reinforce the thing about the grades. Um, I spent uh, probably the final 10 years of my career at Microsoft um, doing interviews for people who wanted to come. And a lot of them were, were college. Microsoft has a pretty strong program for hiring kids out of college. Um, I don't recall ever looking at anybody's um, resume and, and looking to see what their GPA was. I don't recall ever asking anybody, hey, you know, why did, why did you get a B in that? Um, now, I wasn't hiring people to be developers, and that might be a little bit different if you're in a highly technical area. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a different kind of, if you're in a, let me use the phrase, normal environment, um, interviewers want to know what you learned, not what you did. Um, people who, who put together a resume that said, you know, I was, I did this and I did this and I did this and I did this. Um, my question was always, well, what'd you learn from doing that? Mm -hmm. You know, 
how did you come out of that? So it's really, you know, that, that's one thing. People want to know um, what you learned, not necessarily what you did or what your grades were. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only time I was ever impressed by anybody's grades was a kid who was a linebacker at Georgia Tech who got a five-year engineering degree in oh, three wow. years. And I'm going, how do you play football and get a five-year engineering degree in three years? <laughs> pretty impressive. And we hired him and he's done great. He's been really good at what he does. Um, I followed that one for a while. Um, and the other thing is um, we look, and, and I always look for people who could think and people who could answer kind of off the wall questions. And I'd try to twist things around and, and ask them again and say, what, what did you mean by that? Or blah, blah, blah. Um, and And Microsoft also is famous for having trick questions. And so the, the answer to a trick question is not the answer. The answer is, well, what did, what, how did you respond to that? And what did you come up with? You know, the, my favorite one was why are manhole covers round? Um, and, you know, there are people sit there, scratch their heads and come up with really weird answers, but there actually are some true answers to that one. But it, it was, it was not to get the true answer. It was to see what that, how that person thought. So um, that's, that's an important thing. Don't, don't uh, uh, learn how to manage your time um, and, and live on your own. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, present when you interview, present what you learned, not what you did. Mm -hmm. And then Michael, do you have anything to add on to your biggest struggle outside of financial needs in college? Yeah, so we're all different and we all come from unique, different backgrounds. My challenge wasn't typically, you know, outside of college. It was really inside of college. And I say that because, you know, my last couple of, my junior year and my latter part of my sophomore, my junior year, I really kind of lost my way. I had, unfortunately, an older sister I was very close with that died of leukemia. And so, you know, I... I I can't even recall that period of time because I just was lost. I loved it dearly and it was such a, I, I just grieved. So I didn't wake up until, you know, really my senior year. And, and hence that's why to some degree, you can't fault that counselor for saying, I see three options of General Motor, Fords or Chrysler in your future. Cause my grades were, you know, B, B minus. Uh, but, but I was, a, I'm a driver and I've always been a driver. You know, even though I talked about not having my own bedroom, I would, I would daydream okay, of, about, again, wanting to look at having a career success. I would daydream about being my own boss. And, and, the, and I've, had a great, I've had a great experience as an entrepreneur over the last series of years. And I had some challenges too. So, you know, the trajectory has not been always just a rising star that just didn't have any deviation. But the reality is, is that my challenge wasn't so much because I'm a boy and lot, like a lot of boys, you know, we got a structure. I had to work. I was a working college student. So I had to work in order to be put food, you know, to eat and to look at putting gas in the car. But because in fact, I needed that academic support, I lived in the library. I literally lived in the library. I live going to, again, what you guys would call study hall, but going to, you know, academic support hall with, with when I started my first year. And when I started, again, this was a year after this rebellion, after the riot. So from a time, timing standpoint, it was really a unique, interesting time in American history. Again, way before you guys were born, we did have color TVs. Okay, so just don't think it was all black and white. So don't go there, <laughs> do not go there. But at the end of the day, you know, we had the, the heights of the civil rights movement, the height of the women's movement. And so there was always something, even though I couldn't participate a lot because I had to go to work in the afternoon, that was going on in the world and going on into Detroit. So it was a great time, you know, for my generation X group of people. And so, uh, you know, go outside of the college in terms of challenges, not, not really, again, a real issue for me because a structured deal, I, you know, I knew what I did, just like getting up in the morning, you know, brushing your teeth and taking a shower. My day was really structured. I had to be structured. But academically, there was an issue where, again, I didn't have great study habits. I literally had to learn that. I literally had to learn to look at really engaging to make up the lost time that I, in fact, had um, unfortunately let 
pass uh, when I was in high school. Thank you all for sharing your personal experiences for that last question. Um, this question is for Hank. Um, can you talk more about your journey from a liberal arts to computer science? As a liberal arts major, it's really encouraging hearing about the options open to you with the Liberal Arts Foundation. Sure. Um, you know, liberal arts, by definition, you don't learn specific skills. You learn a whole bunch. Um, one of the favorite quotes I have about education comes from a guy named Nicholas Kristof, who writes for the New York Times. And his quote is, education isn't about filling a bucket, but about gaining a tool belt. When, especially when you get a liberal arts degree, but when you get any degree from college, you, you, learn, you learn a lot of stuff, but you also learn how to think and how to come up with questions and how to come up with answers. And you know, what, what, I, what I walked away from at my, with my education at, at University of Detroit was, how does that work? What, is, what does that mean? How do they do that? And when I was at the newspaper, um, you know, I, they put me down in front of a computer terminal and I'd be doing this and then I'd have a little bit of time and I'd go, I wonder what happened, what happens if I hit this button? Or what, you know, and most people of my generation are kind of reluctant to hit a button and not know what's gonna happen. I think that your generation is probably a lot more daring when it says, oh, let me find out what this does and whatever it is. But the, the, the basis is that I wanted to find out everything that that system could do because I was sitting there and, and I'd stay at, I'd stay after work and talk to the technicians who worked on it or the system managers. And I got good enough at it that when they had an opening for that job, they said, hey, would you like to do that? And I have, an, I have a knack for it because I would ask questions and say, well, will it do this? And how does it do that? And boy, it would be cool if it did whatever it is. And so I ended up writing some code and doing some stuff like that. And then when I get into networking and personal computers, they're the same thing. They're just, they're little tools and figuring out how to make those tools do what I wanted them to do was the challenge I had. And that was where I was successful. And when I was working at Microsoft, my job was to find the right resources for my customers. So I had to understand what's my customer trying to do? What do our tools do? And let me find the right person to put in between them so that they'll accomplish what they want to accomplish. So the Liberal Arts Foundation puts a lot of question marks in your brain. What's that mean? What's that do? Could it do this? And that's what made the switch easy for me. And I think it would also work, you know, obviously not going into dentistry or law because that's a specific training, but I think a liberal arts foundation is great for becoming an architect or an engineer, you know, a graduate degree, uh, well, graduate degree in architecture, things like that, because you'll look at something and you'll say, could I do it this way? Could I do it that way? How will it do this and how will it do that? Um, so learning, I call it learning how to think. And that's what I got out of my liberal arts degree. Our next question is for all three. Have you ever had experience with imposter syndrome? If so, what advice would you have to offer to a new graduate in managing self-esteem and owning space in a room with very qualified people? And we'll start back up with Christian. Yes, I would say, you know, it's easier to look back at this retrospectively. Um, starting my new job at Toyota was very difficult. And I'll be transparent with that. It was very difficult for me. Toyota is a difficult company to navigate. There's a lot of acronyms. There's a lot of systems you have to use. They have a different kind of methodology. And at some point I did feel like um, I was starting to feel like maybe I just was not a good fit for that role. And it was very difficult for me to get um, adjusted. Um, what I did to be honest, it may seem cliche and it's not super specific, but I just didn't give up. Honestly, I just, you know, I kept pushing, I kept doing what I could. Um, I kept giving it all I could. And to be transparent, I was actually, you know, I don't, didn't used to share this, but I was actually placed on a PIP, which is a performance improvement plan for those who may not know what that is. And that was in four to five months of the organization. And that is with, with being with the organization. And that's essentially their way of saying, <laughs> we're documenting everything from an HR perspective so that 
<laughs> you may end up getting fired. So I was able to overcome that. Um, I kept putting my all into it. I kept just doing what I could to make sure I didn't lose my job. And one thing my boss told me during our you know, review, he said, you know, you may struggle sometimes, but one thing I know about, I noticed about you is that you do not give up. You keep doing what you gotta do and you put your all into it. So I guess that's just my long answer of saying, don't give up. You know, sometimes you feel out of place as a new grad when you're sitting there with more seasoned professionals, but we all started at the quote unquote bottom. Nobody started their job and was just, an instant subject matter ex expert, even doing what I do now. I'm self-employed, but I learn as I go. I've learned things that I didn't know two and a half years ago. So really just don't give up. That's just my biggest thing to tell people. It sounds easier said than done, but you know, hang in there. I came, I had a definitely, I had a big struggle getting acclimated from the student life to being a full-time employee. And there's a difference. And it was definitely a shock to me because I'm someone who, high performing academically had you know over three five had three internships did well in the internships and then all of a sudden I get this full-time job and there's a disconnect and I'm struggling so it definitely took some time for me to get acclimated and just know that if that is you you're not alone don't feel that you're alone and hey feel free to reach out to me if you need help <laughs> Let me let me jump in next, and I'm going to go back to the answer I gave on the previous question, which is it all has to do with question marks. Um, when you walk into a room, there's nobody who knows everything. Well, there might be, but it's pretty rare where, <laughs> where everybody, where somebody will know everything. There are other people who were scratching their heads, going, "I don't know what that means," um, or "Gee, what would you know? What's the right way to do that?" And for one person, especially a new person, to say, "I don't know what that is. Can you explain it to me?" Um, then, you know, that's not a black mark against you. The fact that you're curious, the fact that you're willing to admit your shortcomings or what you don't know yet, which is not a shortcoming, but what you don't know yet um, is, is a positive thing. And then you learn it. And the next time you're in that meeting and somebody else pipes up and says, I don't know what that is, you can give them the answer. Um, so it all builds. That's your way of paying it forward. Um, but don't ever be afraid to say, I don't know. Um, giving a bluster answer will, will brand you much worse than saying, let me get back to you on that. And that works with your peers, that works with your management, that works with your customers. Um, and you learn from that. And the next time you get asked that question, you have the answer. So, um, you know, don't, don't ever be afraid to say, I don't know, or let me get back to you on that. Um, be more afraid of, of trying to bluff your way through something. You know, let me share with the body that uh, I, I was trying to, I was being too kind to myself. I refer to my myself as Generation X when I am in fact a baby boomer. So <laughs> I, I was, that's what happens when you get old. You just forget who you are and where you come from. <laughs> this issue of the imposter syndrome, uh, you know, I share with you, again, being real transparent about my challenges academically when I started the university. So without a doubt, as, as I'm sitting in the classrooms, you know, back during my undergrad days, you're, you're trying to follow again the lecture, you're trying to exchange in terms of again, um, giving commentary or feedback to your professors or even to your students. You know, you had a lot of very enriched, very highly academic folks that uh, I did. I felt somewhat inferior to. Mm -hmm. I felt inadequate in some ways, uh, and, and adequate in terms of expressing my thoughts or my, my views on things. But, but something happened between my freshman year and my, uh, I would say my junior year, where to a large degree, I found my own voice. And that has carried me through to this ripe old age of almost of 70, where at the end of the day, it really came to me, you know what? It doesn't matter what anybody thinks or feels about me. What does matter is that, you know, I'm comfortable in my own skin. You know, you never know who's going to like you and who doesn't. And that really... You know, outside of maybe your, 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 your family, that really doesn't matter. So finding your own voice. So it, as much as, again, as I said, I worked really hard to achieve and I graduated with honors. Mm -hmm. So I was, of course, extremely proud of that. But more critically, it's really as I came into my own where I really did realize that I'm just as good as, I'm just as capable of, and more importantly, from a value position standpoint, if I want something in life, I've got to take it. I've got to go for it, okay? And I don't mean take it in a way where, again, I'm doing anything illegal because I don't believe anybody's going to 
mean, I owes you anything. No one is obligated to do anything for you. However, you want something in life, you've got to go for it. So that the value of hard work, the, the value of never giving up, the value of, again, being comfortable in terms of my own skin. As Hank said, I am not afraid to, in fact, ask the question. If I don't know, I didn't know what, <laughs> I just looked up what it, this issue of uh, imposter syndrome was. I didn't know that, guys. I was going to do so, the same. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going, okay. Uh, that's the new dialogue. For, so I don't know how that, on that term has been out, but from a colloquial standpoint, I, I really didn't know. But I'm even I hadn't looked it up on my phone, I would have asked the question because I don't, it doesn't bother me to, in fact, again, as Hank says, let people know I don't know something and people really will respect that. But, you know, the, the, the key, and I don't know if it works for you, it will ever work for you, but being comfortable in your own skin, mm -hmm. being comfortable in terms of having your own inner voice and, and making a go of it. And mm -hmm. life should be a journey and it should be fun. And it should be one that's engaging where you're always a student learning and growing and developing. Okay, as old as I am, there's still that issue where daily I wake up and what's the new challenge that I want to put before me? I'm lucky I've got a great group of people that help me keep operational trains running with my businesses. So it is not me, it's them. But they teach me something every day. Every day I learn something new and it's really cool. Okay, and I, I think it keeps me young. It really does. And you know, the charity starts with, in fact, family. And so my family is most important. My grandchildren are most important, along with my kids and my wife. But then outside of that, because guess what? Those guys are good. You know, I worked hard so that my children didn't have to not have a bedroom. They didn't have to sleep on the couch. It didn't, they didn't have to struggle in terms of, again, being on government relief or not worrying about where the next utility payment is going to come from. I didn't want my kids to go through that. And I don't want my grandchildren to go through that. So that issue of, again, giving back starts with their family. But I want to make sure that others will have those same kind of opportunities. And uh, that, that, in fact, again, my children have, my grandchildren will have to make a go of it. Megan? I think that was some great advice that you all just shared on that last question. Um, on a different note, can each of you share one of your favorite memories from undergrad? I'm, I'm gonna throw mine out there and, and then walk away. Um, having lunch with Clint Eastwood. Mine was taking over the, taking over the um, administrative building. We took over the administrative building, uh, a group of us, um, and again, this is civil rights um, movement or time period. So we was, took over this. Was that, the, the, was that when the sociology professors were let go? It, you know, I don't, I can't remember, Hank. But you know, we we had we held we didn't hold, but but you know, we literally uh, we had a like a two day takeover of that building, and we had Father Karen and James Woodruff exactly. and uh, James Ray Rayburn that in a sense we were like our hostages and it was just a great experience I, and, and there's guys we have had such great leadership in terms of UDM and again that's why I'm just grateful for these folks taking a chance on me but more critically we've had some trailblazers that paved that way for that university to in fact excel and and and, and you know this Detroit University of Detroit Mercy is unique there's not a lot of universities mm -hmm. in urban areas that has done it so much for the community as UDM has. Mm -hmm. And we've got a great mm -hmm. leader in, in Dr. Garibaldi. I mean, mm -hmm. it, what he's done to, to, in fact, put the university, continue to put the university on the map is, is just really critical. What the board is doing to look at trying to continue to provide opportunities for, again, students as well as staff is just amazing. Mine's, I guess, not as elaborate, but I guess, I'd probably say um, for me, was taking my first international trip. Um, I went to Barcelona, Spain, and I took Spanish. One tidbit about me: I took Spanish in uh, undergrad, um, high school, middle school, so I can speak it fluently. So it was kind of good to actually be able to be someplace where that was the primary language, and then just get some international exposure. So I think that's probably one of my most revered memories. 
Um, we have a couple more questions um, for everyone. Is there a rule or rules you all have followed over the years for handling your money, saving, investing, budgeting, et cetera? Yeah, just make a lot of damn money. <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, make a lot of damn money, okay? So that, again, utilities, you know, just basic living, that, that's, that's not really, that's important. And then they get to a point where, again, you know, when you've got significant income coming in, you've got a, you know, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but you know, you, you've got a half a million dollars, a three quarters of a million dollars, a million dollars more. You want to talk about changing the dynamics in terms of not only your life and your family's life, but then others, you know, and that's, that, that, that I will share with you, that's my expectation that people on this darn call, I, I have of, of, even though I don't know you, that you would do. Because again, at the end of the day, there is a need to write a check. There's a need to write a check, whether it's to your kids or to your, your, your nieces and nephews or to the university. And that means you got to make a lot of money. You need to make a lot of money. Be a nice person, but make a lot of money. Um, that's a good question. I think as we get older, we kind of make better financial decisions. I mean, I don't think I did anything that was ever horrible, but you know, but when you're younger, you kind of, you do things that maybe you shouldn't, but <laughs> so I think what I just set some goals for myself. You know, I set savings goals. Um, I downloaded some apps. There's one called Acorns. It rounds up your uh, purchases and it invests it. Um, I started getting to a point where I just said, you know what, I'm done with credit cards. So I just paid it off and just really stopped using it. Not that that's necessarily the best advice either, because also you can get rewards points if you do use them. But the tip, the, the tip is pay it off in your 30 day period so that you can essentially get your rewards points and whatever. So, you know, I don't know if there's any just one thing in particular, but I think, you know, you grow, you know, you're younger. We all do some things. We're like, I didn't need to buy that or I probably didn't need to charge that. But, you know, just growth and just making sure you really have a cushion. You know, they say statistically the average American does not have five hundred dollars in cash for to cover an emergency. And I never want to be in that situation, to be honest, where if something happens, I can't have cash to cover it. I have to go to someone and ask them or I have to charge it. So my biggest thing is to tell people is start young because what you do now will set the tone for what you do later. So start saving your money. If you guys got internships, you know, remember I had an internship in grad school. I was at Detroit Mercy. I was making like over $20 an hour, which seemed like a heck of a lot of money back then when I didn't really have a lot of overhead. But start saving that, you know, do not spend all that in, in, you know, go shopping and go trips and whatever, you know, and then not have anything to show for it. Pay yourself first. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's an impression I've always heard, pay yourself first, so. Christian, that is a great response. Good for you, great response. Thank you. I like the, the three parts that Michael put in there, which is saving, investing, and budgeting, but I'd flip it around. I put budgeting first. Um, and when you do your budget, you need to, budget for saving. Um, you need to put something away, even if it's just a small amount every paycheck, every week, every month, whatever it is, put something aside so that you do have that cushion. And if you do plan to take a trip to Barcelona as you know, after you graduate and you plan to take a trip to Barcelona and speak Spanish, put that in your budget. And mm -hmm. then when you have that money, go ahead and take your trip to Barcelona. Don't, don't do it. A, don't do it when you can't pay for it. Um, and save up for the future and invest because that's the way you can um, extend your savings and income for a lot longer if you invest it wisely. And for our last question, for all three of you, you are all currently making very generous gifts to Detroit Mercy. Can you speak to how or when you decided to start giving back to both Detroit Mercy and or to other organizations? I'll take that one first. I have been a giver, I guess, for I don't know how many, I really can't think of how many years, but even though in fact, I was in a position to um, give significant amount of, 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 again, capital. I wanna say that four or five years after, in fact, graduating from school, particularly my MBA, I would, I've always gave something. And, and, and then over the years, again, my contributions have increased. Uh, and then I set this scholarship up uh, in the name of my 
a former counselor probably s seven years ago and still support. I mean, we support university building funds. So that's another uh, endowment that we've done. So uh, let me also, because we're close to, to closing, but, you know, I, Christian and Hank gave real practical information. And I don't maybe flip it when I talk about make a lot of money. But when you can, you, you need a budget, you need to have savings, what have you. But you folks on this call, you're going to go one or two tracks. You're going to look either being self-employed and being entrepreneurish, which is a tough road to go down, i got to tell you, or you're going to do the corporate business thing, or you work for the hospitals. At the end of the day, never apologize, never apologize in terms of the value that you bring. So when you go and you have the, the salary negotiation, whether it's corporate or whether it's in fact the work that you do as an entrepreneur, never apologize for bringing value to the work you do and getting paid for that. But you really do want to, I'm trying to present the concept of having a, a mindset. You want to get beyond again, the issue of worrying about utility payments and mortgage payments. You want to look at having enough capital to really be able to in fact, again, have a quality of life where there's independence. That's the key. And in, and from a business standpoint, again, I'm not that wasn't that smart maybe to see in corporate America. So relegated to entrepreneurship. But I do know that early on as a kid, if somebody was paying me a dollar, they had to be making a dollar fifty or dollar twenty-five or two dollars. And that's why I did the entrepreneurial route. Ain't been easy, but at the end of the day, I've been lucky and been fortunate. All right, so not to cut this short for everyone, because I know we still have two people that haven't responded to that question, but just in case any of our students have to go and make classes, I really wanted to just take a moment to thank everyone for being here. Um, I hope you all leave today feeling proud and inspired, um, proud to be a Titan. Um, and we just want you to know that the Office of University Advancement is here for you um, as students and alumni. Um, and want to ensure your continued success um, for now and the future. Um, and we have numerous opportunities for you to get involved um, through mentoring, speaking to a class, um, volunteering, um, and we always look forward to your input. Um, so lastly, our panelists wanted to share um, their information with you in case you'd like to reach out to any of them afterwards. So I'm gonna put a slide up on the screen here um, with their contact information and you can feel free to reach out to them at any time. Um, so let me go ahead and get that up. And, and while Angeline is doing that, I wanna um, make one comment, which is giving to the university or giving back isn't always necessarily just money. Give back your time, give back your, your what you know, um, you know, work with kids who are students who are younger than you um, help people be successful. Um, and that's just, that's just as good as giving money. Um, the thing that I mentioned there about budgeting, saving and investing, your budget should include something for giving, even if it's, you know, you're not, even if it's a small amount, it's a habit that you get into and it's one that will pay you back many ways. And my last tidbit would also be, you know, don't think just because you see people who are, you know, they're successful and they, you know, look like they have it all. You do not know what it took to get, <laughs> to get that. Don't think that people just had it easy flowing their whole lives and that they didn't have their, you know, struggles and ups and downs. Like I said, you know, yes, I have, you know, now my own business and I was able to resign from a, you know, nine to five, but it came with the struggles and, you know, I definitely, uh, this did not happen overnight. So, you know, thief comparison can be the thief of joy. Great. Well, I think that concludes our panel today. So thank you again for everyone who participated today. Uh, don't forget to write down this contact information if you wanna reach out to any of our panelists. And um, we hope that you will continue to participate in some of our other day of giving activities today. Um, the link to those are in our chat. Um, until we see you again, you all take care. Thanks, Angelina. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you. Good job, guys. <laughs> Very good. Thank, thank you for inviting inviting uh, us to participate in this. I know this was 
um, been, this was uh, rewarding both ways. Good, good. I would say it was very successful. <laughs> the fact that we went all the way to two o'clock is success. <laughs> there were questions. Yes, there was lots of questions. <laughs> all right, well, take care in North Carolina. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.